This video is brought to you by Ubisoft. Welcome back everybody, I'm Nick930, and today we're going to be discussing Rainbow Six Siege's new Year 5 Season 3 content, Operation Shadow Legacy. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Rainbow Six Siege, or just haven't played it in a long time, Siege is a competitive 5v5 tactical shooter game, where a team of attackers attempt to breach a fortified structure held by a team of defenders all while utilizing a large variety of unique operatives equipped with interesting weapons and gadgets. The game has maintained a surprisingly healthy online player base since its initial release in 2015, and the developers appear to still be strongly committed to expanding on this universe, with characters from other Tom Clancy game properties now making an appearance, including the iconic Sam Fisher from the Splinter Cell series. And because I'm a sucker for anything involving Splinter Cell, I wanted to take a deep dive today and explore all the major changes coming to Siege in Season 3, including an in-depth look at the latest map redesign, an overview of the biggest changes to the gameplay, and some hands-on impressions of the latest Operator Zero and what his new abilities bring to the table. I also want to thank Ubisoft for sponsoring this video. If you're interested in trying out Rainbow Six Siege but have been waiting for a good opportunity to jump in, you can pick up Siege on sale right now for 75% off, or you can invite some friends to install it and play for free all week starting today. You can find more information in the links provided in the description. So let's kick this off by first going over one of the biggest changes in this update, the rework to the map Chalet. Chalet has been in the game since its initial release back in 2015, and has always been one of my favorites. It's a two-story residential home in the mountains with lots of unique places to fight, like a trophy room, a library, bar, and even a wine cellar in the basement. But it's never been without its faults, as the map design leans heavily in favor of the attacking team thanks to its abundance of entry points and convenient outdoor sight lines. With this latest season though, you're going to need to relearn this map all over again, as almost every angle and entranceway has been redesigned to be more competitive. The main foyer, for example, has had its front door sealed off, with the only access being a window on the left, and a new hidden window hidden around the south corner. The staircase has also been relocated to the trophy room, which not only makes the trophy room smaller, but also forces its typical objectives over into the dining room instead. The kitchen looks mostly the same, albeit a bit wider, and the sink window has been completely sealed off, so there's no way for attackers to snipe into it from the gazebo anymore. You've also noticed that this hallway has been moved over a bit now, breaking up the long sight line from the dining room to the trophy room entrance. Moving down to the basement, you'll find a mostly similar layout as before. There's the snowmobile room that's been widened a bit, with the staircase now taking up much less space. And there's a brand new pathway that connects the maintenance hall to the side of the wine cellar. The wine cellar room has also been widened a good amount. There's no longer that small separate wine closet in the middle, and in its place are two wide lanes with shelves on either side. Moving back up the stairs to the fireplace room, we now get a slightly more condensed area, with a fireplace that juts out a lot more. This section was typically a killing floor, but with the upstairs balcony windows sealed off and the window in the southeast corner being removed, defenders should have an easier time moving around here. The bar and game room have seen some very similar changes to the wine cellar, with a new rotation hallway added into the south side, a reduction in the amount of window entry points, and much wider spaces, probably implemented to avoid those uncomfortably close quarter situations behind the bar in the old version of the map. And then we have the upstairs. The upstairs has seen some of the biggest changes in this map. First, there's a library that has fewer of those tall sight line blocking shelf units. They also removed the west-facing doorway, opposite of the large window, making it much more difficult for attackers to camp the room from the ledge outside. Down the hall a little bit further, you'll find a new piano area in the much wider upstairs corridor that should help with callouts a good amount. The side office has been expanded, the sort of closet on the south side, and no more window for attackers to breach in from, and the door to the exterior balcony now has hard cover on the other side of it preventing defenders from having a clean line of sight to the ladder on the opposite end. Then we have the master bedroom. The bedroom's layout is roughly the same. The large window on the east side is still there, and the bed has not been moved at all. But instead of a doorway on the west side of the room leading into a bathroom, the exterior balcony on the north side has been replaced with a new solarium, serving as a rotational point into a much larger bathroom. 
Alongside all these layout changes, I also noticed some disappointing detail changes that kind of take away from the character of the level itself. You'll notice several of the exterior plants and trees have been removed, and a lot of the interior flooring that used screen space reflections have been changed into less interesting concrete floors instead. Like a lot of the other map reworks, the level now feels a bit too grid-like, with very boxy architecture. It no doubt makes the map significantly more competitive and balanced, and probably also improves player target acquisition by scrapping all the needless visual filler. But it's a shame that we have to see so much of the great attention to detail and unique decor scrapped just for the sake of improving the competitive atmosphere. All that being said, I did notice some nice new screen space reflections applied to the road outside along with some other new features like music playing on the jukebox that never played before. You can also now repel onto the roof for the first time, giving attackers much easier access to areas like the rear balcony and the side windows that were a complete pain to reach before. Next up, let's take a look at some of the more universal changes that have been applied to this season, starting with Ping 2.0. The Ping system for Rainbow Six Siege has not aged quite as well, for those unfamiliar, players can aim their crosshair at any surface and press a key to place a temporary yellow marker for their teammates, and then provide direct communication to indicate what they're trying to point out. For a team that's constantly using their mics, this has been an invaluable tool. Though in the heat of combat, it could also get a bit confusing with players popping off yellow waypoints all over the place. Ping 2.0 aims to improve on this feature by adding in new contextual icons based on where the player pings. Spotting an enemy drone, for example, will now show a little drone icon in the 3D display, giving everyone, including players without a headset, a chance to stay in the loop on what's going on. On top of this, players can also ping while controlling their drones or cameras, and can even do so after they've been killed, which should circumvent those annoying situations where you're the last man standing and everyone's screaming into their headset about which direction they think they heard somebody. Next, there's the new Universal Attacker Gadget, the Hard Breaching Charge. The Hard Breach Charge works a lot like Thermite's unique Thermite Charge, in that it can be used to destroy reinforced walls. But unlike Thermite, this device only makes a medium-sized hole in the wall, and also cannot be remotely triggered, instead detonating on a timer shortly after being placed. This change will no doubt significantly change how players play Siege, as it now greatly reduces those moments where the attacker team finds themselves unable to breach into a room simply because they forgot to select a Hard Breacher. At first, this seemed like a pretty big disservice to those particular operators, making their special abilities feel redundant. However, upon closer inspection, I think I get why Ubisoft decided to implement this, as they only offer this new hard breach charge to select operators that were already not being chosen very often. Characters like Ying, Fuse, Finca, Amaru, Capital, and Lion, whose abilities have either gone largely ignored by the player base, or have become easy to avoid, now have even more incentive tied to them so we may see some more interesting picks moving into this season. The next big change comes from the Defender team, with a new Reinforcement Pool. Until now, each Defending Operator was given only two reinforced walls to deploy during the round. But more often than not, Defenders would struggle to find the time during the prep phase to deploy both these two walls and their Operator-specific devices ahead of the attack. But with Shadow Legacy, the entire Defender team is given access to a Reinforcement Pool of 10 walls that can be deployed by anyone on that team. This means operators like Rook, who simply have to drop a bag on the ground at the start, can now spend the remainder of the prep phase putting up all the walls for his team alone, while everyone else runs around finding clever spots to defend or set up traps. This is also a great way to ease in new players to the experience, who all too often ask more experienced players where they should deploy their walls each and every round. Next, we have an interesting new tweak that has been made to all the weapons in the game, more specifically, the weapon sites. With Operation Shadow Legacy, all the weapon sites are being reworked into new variants, with all new reticles. According to Ubisoft, the reasoning behind this is to provide a more accessible experience to players who are either colorblind or visually impaired. A few of the weapons will still have some of the older sites, but the red dot glow effect has been removed from all of them, and you can now tweak the coloration and opacity in the game's menus. Moving on, we have a few other miscellaneous changes, including a new map ban system to give players more control over what map gets chosen in the matchmaking system, a new match replay mode, currently only scheduled to release for the test servers, a balancing tweak to the operator Thatcher, 
making his EMP blast only disable gadgets rather than destroying them. A drop in the price of seven different operators by 5,000 renown. And last but not least, one of my favorite new features, the addition of the new operator Zero, aka Sam Fisher. Right away, this season feels like a huge shout out to longtime fans of the Splinter Cell property, with a new main menu screen eerily reminiscent of the original game's cover art, a reworked version of Eben Tobin's soundtrack from the Battery Stage in Chaos Theory that coincidentally also played in the multiplayer menus for that game, and even more obvious than that is Zero's kit that is decked out with his iconic SC-20K assault rifle, referred to here as the SC-3000, his signature 5.7 silenced pistol, and his unique gadget, the Argus Launcher. Again, another callback to the classic Splinter Cell games. The Argus Launcher can be used to launch a unique take on the sticky camera that can not only stick to any solid surface, but can even burrow through weaker surfaces to give players a clear view into the room on the other side. By pressing spacebar, players can even swap between either side of the wall, providing even more intel. And what's more, Zero is given four of these cameras, making him the master of recon for the attacking team. But that's not all these cameras can do. Much like the Twitch drone, each camera is also equipped with a special dart that can be fired at enemy devices to disable them instantly. Zero himself also looks a little bit different than what we're used to when it comes to Sam. Fisher is now much older, with a thick beard and gray hair, and is apparently not as nimble as he used to be. He's wearing a new, heavy winter coat, covering up what looks like his classic wetsuit, and is sporting a backpack, much like the bag he carried in most of Conviction. He's also not wearing his iconic trifocal goggles, though they are still hanging on a clip behind him. It's a painful tease, considering we've gone an entire console generation without a single standalone Splinter Cell game. But it's fun to see Splinter Cell and Rainbow teaming up again, and Ubisoft has even expressed interest in bringing in other properties to the fold, like Ghost Recon and maybe even an agent from The Division. Now, pushing aside the fact that Sam Fisher's in the game now, Zero is actually a pretty solid operator overall. His SC-3000 has a really nice feel to it, with a tight bullet spread and high rate of fire, and it's nice to finally have another new gun added to the game after so long. His Argus Launcher is a great device, though the noise it makes is pretty distinct and obvious, and it's pretty easy to spot as a defender. But still, with four available cameras to launch and a powerful arsenal of firearms, Zero is a force to be reckoned with, and he'll no doubt have a noticeably high pick rate for the foreseeable future. But what do you guys think? Are you excited for the new Shadow Legacy season for Siege, or were you expecting more from Sam's arrival to Team Rainbow? Let me know in the comments section. I also want to thank Ubisoft for sponsoring this video. If you're interested in playing now, don't forget that you can pick up the game for 75% off. Or if you're still on the fence, go ahead and try it for free all week long starting today to September 4th. If you already have the game and just want a full list of patch notes, I've also provided a link to Ubisoft's patch notes below in the description. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos posted every week.